Good evening. I'd like to open the uh, July 23rd meeting of the Hamilton Planning Board. Uh, on the agenda tonight, we have a board presentation and discussion of the hazard mitigation plan being prepared by MAPC, a continued uh, public hearing on the medical marijuana facility, approval not required um, for the Patton Family Limited Partnership, uh, master planning residential forum recap, and board business. So first up is a uh, presentation and discussion relative to the hazard mitigation plan. So do we have somebody that's making a presentation? Yeah, Sam. Sam Cleave. Sam. Okay, Sam. You've got the floor. Um, can we... Big audience. Can we get a microphone close to him? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for making time. Uh, Patrick, thanks for setting this up. My name is Sam Cleaves. I work for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Uh, I'm here just to give a, this is the second uh, public meeting on the update of the Hamilton Natural Hazards uh, Mitigation Plan. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, run through quickly what's going on with the plan. It will be posted online for your comments soon, within a couple of days, and we'd love it if the, the planning board can check in and just take a look. Uh, we tend not to review it in detail at, at these kind of meetings. It's just uh, doesn't work particularly well. So it, it will be up on the town website uh, at the end of the week, and uh, we would love it if we could get your comments on it, and then we'll, once we have those comments uh, and public, public comments, uh, we will incorporate those and send it up to MEMA. So anyway, uh, why are we doing this uh, plan update? Uh, it's a, a federal requirement, uh, the Act of 2000, the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act. Uh, this is uh, basically the federal government's way of incorporating all departments and getting everybody on board in terms of uh, natural hazard mitigation within each community. Uh, the, the basic premise of these plans is that it will allow uh, the town, once FEMA has signed off on this latest iteration of the plan, to apply for hazard mitigation grants, which are particularly useful. Uh, they've been used, uh, for instance, over on Bridge Street, as you know, for enlarging the culvert over on the bridge there. So uh, the plan for mitigating this, again, uh, for natural hazards only, this does not uh, address uh, biohazards or terrorism or anything like that. Uh, natural causes, uh, climate is, is built in to these natural hazards, so climate change is addressed to some degree within the plan as well. So what is ha hazard mitigation? Obviously, um, looking at ways of reducing or preventing loss of life, injuries, and property uh, by using the correct strategies, uh, taking a look at what the town is doing now, and what additional actions can be taken in the future uh, to safeguard the community. So primarily looking to uh, break the what's known as the cycle of disaster and rebuilding by upgrading um, before you get into a natural disaster situation so that your infrastructure and your, and your services don't break and you don't have to rebuild them. So you're strengthening as you go. Uh, getting into uh, looking at, at what you need. Obviously, in this part of the world, we deal uh, primarily um, with flooding. Uh, a little bit further over on the coast is a different set of problems. But these are the six tools and techniques uh, that are built in and around uh, hazard mitigation. I'll just go through very quickly. Prevention, obviously planning and zoning regs, uh, subdivision site plan, you, you know, bylaws, regs and uh, we are lucky in many ways to have a, a pretty strong uh, mass building code uh, currently being updated for energy and being uh, a three year review period as well for uh, 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 climate change uh, incidents. Property protection again, uh, can you do elevation, flood proofing, storm shutters? Uh, we don't talk much about hurricane roof straps around here yet. Uh, but that's stuff that's pretty common, uh, not too far from here. Again, public education and awareness. Um, this has done, been done primarily for flooding and stormwater, uh, wetlands in, in our part of the world, uh, and with increased uh, activity around uh, natural hazards as we have larger storms. 
Natural resource protection, uh, obviously, um, really your, your primary safeguard, the best buffers, and the best thing you can do is to maintain your open space and wetlands as buffers against uh, flooding and erosion uh, and uh, sediment loss. Stormwater best management practice is one of the significant I items that the town is addressing right now is meeting the, uh, the stormwater federal management, the stormwater permit. Uh, as part of the uh, the plan update. Structural projects, these really jump out from most of the plans that we do. Again, um, examples like uh, the Bridge Street culvert. Um, most communities uh, are engaged in some kind of capital planning and they draw on their own resources as well as uh, state resources. But it's grants like this that really uh, come in handy when you're doing a, a pretty good sized project uh, like a culvert or a dam rebuild. And then and finally, um, for hazard mitigation, emergency services protection. So the expansion or protection of critical facilities like fire and police, um, roadways used as evacuation routes. Um, I've worked pretty closely with uh, Essex recently on looking at Apple Street. As, a, as an evacuation route for when uh, the causeway goes underwater, which it has uh, done several times in the last few years. So how do we do this? Um, we work with a team that's put together locally uh, through, through Joe and, and, and the departments. This is the second of two public meetings. Um, we are nearly uh, done with the first draft of this. As I said, we're gonna be posting that online uh, Patrick will post that, and then once we have a, roughly a two-week review period for public comment, we'll take those comments and then submit it to MEMA for their review and take their comments, make those edits, and then ship it up to FEMA for their review. It's the process that we undergo when we do a plan update, uh, just sort of going around the horn, so to speak. So hazard ID and mapping. So we draw on extensive historical data. Uh, we look at the state hazard mitigation plan. The state has to do a, a plan as well um, for the feds. It's not just uh, localities. Uh, we coordinate with the local team. Obviously the folks in each, in each community knows uh, what uh, runs into trouble during storms or needs to be fixed. Again, a lot of the emphasis around here is on water and how to move it and how to and how to use it um, and, and uh, keep it from damaging property and people. Just uh, some of the some of the other areas: flood zones, geologic hazards, wind hazards. All this stuff is uh, historic uh, data that we get uh, through MassGIS. Just some of the locally identified hazard areas. Um, again, uh, Winthrop Street Bridge, which is still a piece that's going to be ad addressed in the plan update uh, for further work. Miles River, as you know, the vegetation management plan is uh, uh, an outstanding project uh, through the task force that needs to move forward. Chebacca Road, Essex Street, um, and then of course the finally the, the flooding issue, uh, the overflow with the pond down at uh, at the park uh, coming across the Horseshoe Road and Tally Ho Drive <coughs> when the uh, the pond overflow backs up. And then some of the, the brush fire examples, which the chief has given us, uh, they're pretty much the same um, from the last plan. Hurricanes, you name it, uh, average snowfall, about four feet is the average, 48 inches. And then uh, critical facilities, there's 55 sites, again, um, reviewed by the uh, fire and police and by the team. Uh, when we do the update, you can see the, the types of sites that we get into. And then the existing, mitig existing mitigation measures. Uh, comprehensive emergency management plan is another uh, required plan. That is your basic, what do you do in the, in the course of a disaster is your evacuation um, your emergency actions that uh, is kept by your emergency management folks over at the fire department, Mass State Building Code, capital improvements, uh, local emergency planning committees, and then National Flood Insurance Program, uh, of which, the, of course, the, the town is a member. We've got some folks who hold insurance through that program in flood-prone areas. 
uh, best management practices listed there, uh, your, your regs, uh, tree trimming program, which is Hamilton's got and would like to add on to as one of the actions. They'd like to do a, an assessment uh, and uh, warden would like to have a better idea of public trees that need to be addressed and BMPs for brush fire and winter related hazards. So uh, mitigation strategies, we look at what's in the plan, what was in the last plan, what were the gaps, uh, what does the town wanna do in terms of actions and what are the priorities? So these are some of the sample uh, mitigation measures for, for the plan update. I think uh, number one on the list is, is to finish off um, the Winthrop Street Bridge you know, with the flooding around the abutment, the design and build on that. Um, it's just an example of other mosquito trenches uh, ongoing. Obviously, the Miles River plan is a big ticket item um, and will incorporate uh, probably uh, members from the, the task force and will probably take some federal money. I'm not sure exactly how the town will approach that, but certainly uh, PDM could be a part of that if they wanted to be. This is a very common uh, item, uh, you know, large uh, flood studies, so that that may be something you want to look into. Again, the uh, federal stormwater permit, uh, reducing stormwater and flooding problems, the Medivac site uh, for emergency medical response, uh, continuing beaver control, adding a, stand, a water, water stand pipe at Sagamore Hill. I know that you're in the middle of an open space and recreation plan update. And um, the town has done a nice job of um, addressing some of the items from the last plan. Uh, there was significant uh, emergency generation backup added over the last uh, five to seven years. And then uh, again, as I mentioned previously, looking at public tree data, creating uh, a, a uh, a database sort of it's it's done more of on sort of a windshield survey basis right now and then really at sort of looking at an overall assessment plan for publicly owned street trees um, rights away um, that may need to be addressed either before a storm or just need to be pruned for uh, good health so those are that's not all of them but that's just give you sort of an across the board idea of, of some of the uh, the measures within the plan that will be suggested that have been suggested by the town. So again, you know, what happens with this? Um, this goes to MEMA once we incorporate public comment uh, and then uh, once we've addressed MEMA's uh, any issues that they've had, uh, we'll incorporate those and send the plan up to FEMA for their review. Once uh, FEMA reviews the plan, which is typically just in, in a couple of months, uh, we'll come back in front of the Board of Selectmen to adopt the plan. Uh, the plan is not binding on the town. It, it really just acknowledges, uh, the, the board acknowledges that the plan is complete. They've seen it and they recognize it. Um, and then you're good to go basically for another five years uh, for these uh, pre-disaster mitigation grants. So they, they do come in handy. Um, and we feel that the, the plans, although they're not particularly exciting and they, they tend to be somewhat uh, written in boilerplate that's acceptable to MEMA and FEMA, if you've worked with MEMA and FEMA in the language that they like to see things in, they are very, very useful in terms of having people have a, sort of a across the board look at natural hazard issues that may be impacting their community. So uh, we feel that they're very useful uh, in, in getting things done that way. So. Again, uh, I'll work with Patrick to, to get the plan up and posted on the town website. Um, comments can be sent directly to me at, uh, at that email address, and we'll obviously repeat that uh, to you again on the, on the website. Uh, but we'd love to have the, the planning board and members of the community uh, take a look at it, uh, get any comments, see what we've missed, uh, see if we've made any errors, and uh, get your edits in a timely fashion so that we can complete this plan and, and get it up to uh, MEMA as quickly as possible. So that's about it for me. Uh, are there any questions that I can answer or um, hope to answer? Must be the one you did for the Cape. So, <laughs> that's no joke these days, right? If you're down on the Cape. Is there a deadline uh, for 
uh, either public officials or private citizens submitting comments before it goes to Well, we, I'm, I'm going to be done with it uh, by the end of the week uh, to send to Patrick. We typically will post for 14 days uh, and let it know just to keep it moving. Um, these can always be amended later if people if something you know radical happens. But this is sort of a, a pro forma. We like to get as much uh, input as possible, but we, we also want to make sure that this runs through the cycle in a timely fashion for the, the town folks that are trying to get uh, money back. I know that um, Joe's particularly concerned about being reimbursed for the work on the Bridge Street culvert, which is why, why we really need to move this through. So, I noticed that you included earthquakes in there. How do you address that? Uh, earthquakes, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very uh, low incidence, uh, you know, high damage kind of item. We, we've, you know, fortunately, we don't have that many of them. There's a, a tremor or two here or there. Typically, we ask um, older communities in New England to take a look at older masonry buildings um, and look at uh, unreinforced old masonry buildings to assess them to see, you know, what would happen if you did have a quake. It's sort of an ongoing item. Most towns never quite get around to looking at all of them. And usually by the time these updates come through, most of those buildings have been updated anyway. There, there aren't that many really older public buildings uh, in existence anymore. Most of them disappeared when we got into steel reinforced concrete buildings in the what, early 60s. And, and most of those buildings are gone. So, but it's, it's some we have to address, <laughs> again, uh, when you when you read this, you may say, "Gosh, you know, who? Why did you write it like this?" It's a little stilted because we have to write this thing to cover regulations that are written as part of the federal act. So over time, <laughs> the regional planning agencies have developed somewhat of a recipe for doing these things, as have other vendors, to get them through MEMA and FEMA in a timely fashion in in language that is uh, appealing to those guys and that sort of checks their boxes and gets this plan done and gets the thing updated so that the towns can use them as quickly as possible. So, Any other questions? Great. Look forward to your comments if time. That would be great. Thank you so much. Thank right. you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Why are you right. shutting down Apple Street? I thought it was a dead end street. It's where the mill goes off to the right if you're going between in Essex or between uh, Hamilton and Essex, right? No, Apple Street comes back out on uh, Southern Avenue. If you start out by the bridge off of 22 and then you wind around and you go around, it eventually comes out okay. back on Southern Avenue by King's Court. I don't know where that is, but I believe you. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Okay, um, item number two is continued public hearing for the medical marijuana facility, and I see that the applicant has requested a continuance. Do you want me to make a motion for the continuance? Um, that would be wonderful. So I make a motion that we approve the continuance of the hearing for Green Meadow Farms, LLC, 654 Asbury Street. To Next. Planning board meeting? Which would be August the 6th. To August the 6th, 2019. Do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, thank you. Patrick, do we know that they're going to be here that night? Because I'm being on vacation, I think. I don't know if that's going to be another continuance. I don't know if that's going to be a So I, I thought they already continued to late in August. It's been a roll-in thing. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay. And uh, the next item is approval not required, submitted by Robert Patton on behalf of the Patton Family Limited Partnership to propose modifications of property lines. And a parcel otherwise known as Hamilton and Sasha's map, 19 lot 4. Yes, hi, good evening. I'm uh, Wayne Jalbert with Hancock Survey representing the Patton family. On the property, um, what Patrick's putting in front of you is a Form A plan. And um, if you haven't seen it in advance, I don't have an easel with me to put it up. Um, 
but I, I can speak to the plan uh, once you have copies in front of you. Uh, by way of background, we were here in December to establish a form A for lot six, which shows on the plan. Lot six separated off the house, the residential house that is numbered 652. Uh, today's um, effort is to create another form A lot, reduced frontage lot, known as lot seven, and that will encompass the house on that's known as house number six, uh, 656. So the intent here is we had created one lot for one of the residential houses, leaving a house with the rest of the farmland. And now the patents have decided they want to take the second dwelling that's out there, put it on its own lot. Uh, you know, it's a reduced frontage lot, but it meets all the zoning requirements for the RA zone of a reduced frontage lot in the groundwater protection overlay district. So it meets all your zoning uh, criteria. Can you run through those criteria then? Because I sure. Yep. Yep. And it, well, in the RA zone. Um, it's uh, 80,000 square foot minimum lot size. Groundwater protection district is the same. Um, those are the dimensional requirements for reduced frontage are 50 feet, which we have 50 feet. And then there's the, um, the add-on. We have to add three acres of area to the minimum lot size, excluding what we would call the throat coming down to the 50 feet of frontage. Yeah. So we have ample area, ample six acres. setbacks. We meet the minimum frontage. Not really, but. Patrick, it looks like this is just the land adjacent to where the Green Meadow Farms proposal is? It is adjacent to it, yes. The Green Meadow Farms is to the. It's right here. It'd right be here. to yeah. the yeah. west, I guess you'd call it. Uh, west. Or to, to the, the right. North. north. Yeah. 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 Um, just for people's curiosity, uh, <clears throat> page 16 of the zoning bylaw special regulations 4.2.3 um, in bold print says frontage exception for larger lots. A lot in an R1A R1B or RA district need not have the specified amount of lot frontage provided that the lot has a minimum continuous street frontage of not less than 50 feet and a width of not less than 50 feet at any point between the street and the site of the dwelling and that the area of the lot exceeds three acres. So. Okay. Seems to me to make any questions. Anybody would like to make a motion to approve the uh, applicant's request? So moved. I make a motion that we approve the A and R for Asbury Street. Assessor's map nineteen lot four. No, that's right. We have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. So, what do we need to sign? Thank you very much. Uh, Patrick, I can come by tomorrow. To okay. If they want to sign All right. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks for coming. That's the one. Does that come off? Okay. <laughs> Patrick, while we're signing this, that quote that you read, that's in the zoning bylaw? Yes. Okay. What page was it again? Do you remember? 14? I, I said 16. 16? 16. 16. Let's start a couple more. 
Talk about no. crazy. Our house no. lot is 30 no. acres. No. And a 50 foot neck. Half a mile. Yes. Yeah, oh, this morning. Is that close enough? Yeah. And then I rolled the wrong number of more afterwards. <laughs> I just rolled it. I'm going to sign it. Sign it. Thank you. Any copies do you need? Two? Yeah. Yeah, I can't be used. Yeah. Does it have to be black? No. What's that? Sure. <laughs> Does this one need to be dated too? They all need it. They all need it. 23rd? <clears throat> yeah, what is today's date? 27-23-19. Oh, you have that pen out. Oops. You're upside down. This is just an extra. Who gets the paper? The paper comes uh, back to you. Just give them to me. What did he say? What did you say? Yeah. No. No. Not right. Okay. All set. Thank you. Thank you. For the clerk, one for the files. Thank okay. you. You can keep that. Extra coloring later. This is the switch for that one. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't. Okay, we're moving right along. Uh, master plan residential forum recap. The board will discuss master planning project status, public forum outcomes, and next steps. Patrick? All right. Uh, I know the consultants are still working on uh, integrating and responding to our comments. As you'll recall, uh, we had uh, uh, made the major comment that uh, the uh, authors didn't really give us any creative approaches um, to addressing density, addressing our growth perspective in the community in a, a fitting way. And they were told to uh, provide us with a number of approaches that uh, would respond to that. Um, you know, we're not a high density community. Uh, don't expect us to be, but look at our bylaws, look at, at uh, ideas of creating duplexes and other kinds of things that give us a modest level of growth that people would, would support. Um, and we're hoping for some uh, suggested bylaw approaches from them as well. Uh, we also talked th with them about when should we best set a uh, public meeting so we can have this presented uh, and, you know, get it posted and get uh, advertised and bring as many people as we can. Uh, we felt like it was better to 
get past the summer vacation period and <coughs> when everybody's busy with baseball games and Little League and all that good stuff. So we felt like a date in September was uh, a better time to do it. Um, I think that we picked a date at about middle of September and I wrote it down somewhere, but I don't remember it. Uh, as soon as uh, I have that date confirmed with the consultants, we'll start uh, focusing on how to get you know, people geared up for the public meeting, get it advertised, maybe get some uh, press, et cetera, uh, so we can get more people engaged in it. I don't remember correctly. It was yeah, I think it was a Thursday. I was I was particularly concerned when we went over the Canterbrook proposal that here you had 17 senior housing lots and they'd advertised for local preference and not received one inquiry. And in you know, it's generally been regarded from surveys from town meeting that one of the goals of our senior housing plans should be to allow seniors that are already in the town to age in place. And Canterbrook is about as inexpensive as you can build. I went and looked at them and looked at their price points and I just found it somewhat contradictory that there was no expressed local interest in buying any of those. And I began to think about whether we could somehow investigate whether or not uh, the junction, whether or not Patton Ridge, what share of those sales had come from people that were prior residents of Hamilton as opposed to we're just providing senior housing for the metropolitan area as a whole. Um, and I thought about it. I went and talked to the assessor and she said, well, it's actually very hard to find <laughs> you can find who the buyer is, but where the buyer lived prior to that is actually a pretty tricky piece of information. But if you have any thoughts about that, I, it may be kind of an interesting thing to know whether or not all of our efforts at densification are actually satisfying a homegrown need and you know, local residents are transferring from one house into those houses or whether we're just building, you know, higher density housing for the residents of the entire Boston area. The question I would have about Canterbrook is what's the price point? They're 500 and up. They started, they go as low as 500,000 and for new housing, you know, you can't. They're actually higher than that. That's what I thought. They're in the 650s. Yeah, and I think that's too high for uh, somebody that's who's what Ridge a senior was. citizen kind of living. Patton Ridge went higher. They were in the sevens, seven, seven fifty. So they advertise at five hundred to eight on their sign. Not the advertisements I've seen. Uh, I saw specifically so, the six hundred. Posting yeah. the correct number on their signs. Yeah, I, I got a question whether the starting point is actually in the kind of range that the seniors, that at least I have in mind, would want to use as a starting point. I mean, if, if you've got a lot of money and you're downsizing from a million dollar house or a $800,000 house, you might want to take a four or five or six, about a five or a six. But if you're not and you've got a four to $500,000 house, you're not going to want a senior citizen housing that starts at five. Well, it's not really senior citizen housing, though. It's just <laughs> locked that way. I, yeah. It's to get approval. Right, it's over age 55. Over age 55. Well, yeah, okay, still 55, but, but still, the yeah, idea is still the same. House. Right. It, the I don't think they're even set up to be single story, are they? No. 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 So, I mean, it's even less yeah. interesting. Exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah. You know, part of this discussion, too, when you you look at the data that we've been provided relative to local incomes, we do have a lot of seniors that are have very limited incomes. And, you know, the idea of being able to provide those folks with 
residences here, I think they jump at the opportunity, but you know, homes that are 580 to 675 at the, the starting points, that's just beyond their means. But you can't, I mean, the general problem with housing in the country as a whole is you can't build, particularly in New England, new housing at price points without some subsidy program at price points that are much lower than five or 400,000. You can build apartments, but you can't build, um, you know, attached or detached single family housing, which is what all of these are. Yeah. Maybe we should think about building apartments. One of the big things that I kept pushing the consultants on is that they weren't addressing the high value of land here and how that translates into that final number. Uh, they didn't do that in the uh, draft master plan. They didn't do that in the housing production plan. And, you know, that's where we need to have them start to, you know, to respond to that because that's not going away. And the only way it can be dealt with relative to creating units that are in that sweet spot of 200 to 400 is going to be through a densification. Well, it's also size. I mean, I, in Canterbury's case, they have less than $100,000 per unit going into the land. That's in terms of what they paid. So if you're selling a $600,000 unit, 80% of the cost is actually construction. You just can't build housing for much less than $200 a square foot. So those houses are all 2,000, 2,200. So that's 450 just in bricks and mortar. You add in 100,000 for each lot, and then you're up to 550 or six. You got to give the guy a profit. It's just, it's just, right? Which not, argue, it's which, not meeting the need. Which, which was our argument when we were talking about cottage housing because that's typically in the 1,200, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 square foot range. Um, and trying to get four units per acre, uh, which is what um, the senior housing bylaw allows. So, as Patrick said, it's going to be density, and it's as you said, it's going to be size. You can't be building 2,000 square foot condominium or 3,000 square foot or whatever you know what, that they're doing in Wenham at, with those price points at 1.4 million dollars. To start. Maybe the other, maybe another approach would be that we think about letting seniors stay in the house they already are. That's a but with property tax abatements, with some program those. to maybe bring the house up the to code. Is the deed restriction? What they have to be deed restricted in order to get a, um, a home improvement loan and so forth. And the affordable housing trust worked on that very hard, and they couldn't do it because. No one would accept uh, having their, they want to pass their, their house on to some market or something. To their children. Yeah. Or they want to sell it and give the proceeds yeah, to, to their equity. children. Yeah. But they won't put a deed restriction on it, so that's the problem. That's if you're talking of affordable housing. Right, right. right. Yeah. No, I'm talking about a lot of these, a lot of seniors do not have a mortgage, so they're living rent-free, but the house is... Well, there it's are large. It's decaying. It's you know, it's not being maintained. Bill, there are um, several programs. Um, there's certainly a state program, and I know two local programs where they can defer their taxes. Right, I know that. Um, and, um, but as far as I know, there's no direct aid program for uh, renovation, and there's no mechanism in town that exists for giving them, you know, grants. We don't have community development block grants. So, and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund goes towards affordable housing, as Peter was describing. You have to get into deed restrictions. So, the question is, I, I think it's a great idea. It'd be wonderful to help use community preservation money. Um, that has, I believe, to go. And I'm not correct on this. Maybe you know, is that affordable housing that that has to go to? Yeah, it has to be affordable. Right. So, we're kind of like a great idea in want of money. So we're kind of caught in that catch-22. Um, so the question is, how do we, 
and the only real answer to that is, um, as you said, size, and then it's density, it's so that you can, um, you know, you get the um, advantage of scale uh, and and the economies that go with it. So um, I think that's what we're we're looking at. But I'd sort of like to think about it. And if we want to get that date, and I think these are all very interesting questions we need to address. Is really getting public participation and people there at this meeting. I think it's on the 19th, Patrick, but I could be wrong. I was kind of re I kind of remember that, but we'll find out what specifically is. But what we really, I think, the board really needs to do is get the widest possible um, representation of, of public um, uh, boards, ZBA, selectmen, affordable housing trust. Um, I'd like to see the school committee or some school committee members there because they're all uh, impacted. Um, certainly the town manager um, and go through and we really ought to um, be aggressive at, at advertising this and getting it out to the public and drawing as wide a population as we can. COA. Huh? COA. Get all those. Council on, uh, yep, yeah. Council on Aging. I started making a list and I didn't unfortunately bring it with me. So, and I think, and I was beginning to think about this is because we're going to be talking about demographics, you know, who, what is Somerville in terms of age and population and income and what do we have for housing types and, um, and hopefully we'll see some suggestion, broad suggestions for maybe uh, approaches that we can address some of the expressed interest in rental or cluster or cottage or duplex or what or, or um, great estates or OSFPD open span, space and farmland preservation which is really a cluster bylaw which is all well and good but I, I'm looking at this and thinking we really need to put it in context because it's going to be you know for us we live it and breathe it see it but for the general people that we're talking to, it's like, okay, so this is Hamilton. Here's some suggestions. Well, that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's nice. But I, uh, oh, the other one I thought of is the Finance Committee. And I really want the Finance Committee to be active in this because, um, and I drew a Venn diagram, which I'll share with people. I'll give it to Patrick and send it around. Because if you look at um, sort of the... We, what are the prime components of, uh, that drives Hamilton in terms of um, its schools, its town government, preservation, public support, public services, it's, um, it's housing because it's 97% of our tax revenue. Um, and I, I think that people need to under, sort of see it visually or, or we need to tell them a story and say, hey guys, this is where all our funds to operate our public operations come from. Your, the land that's available, the houses that you live in. Um, and also I think it's important to show them um, sort of what's available to be built on. Um, because if you look at um, all the preserved land that's in, owned by the state or Greenbelt or it is in, um, land trusts or conservation restrictions that can't be developed, about 70% of Hamilton is, is, is restricted in, in development. So that leaves 30% left, and then you've got to exclude all the stuff that's excluded by wetlands. And um, so there's a really small part, of, and I don't have that number, that actually can be used to grow our tax base or impact our tax base. So I think that's a story that needs to be woven in with this so that people get, oh yeah, okay, so here's where revenue comes from. Here's what we can actually do with the remaining land that we could do something with. And here is the need. So that they actually have a sort of sense, okay, okay. And so here's what we are thinking about. Now we could do nothing and maybe this is where the finance committee comes in or, or whatever, we can do nothing. And in that case, um, we're not addressing the need that's been expressed, but more 
Um, importantly, at least from my perspective, and maybe others as well, is we are um, on a road to um, increasing taxes. So we become more and more expensive, which typically is going to eliminate more and more people from actually settling in the town. Um, as it is, we're losing population. That's what the demographics tell us. So it's not a, it's not a prescription for a robust, diverse, economically stable community. So I, I think that kind of like picture needs to be painted so people have some context from which to make their decisions. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but I was just sort of thinking about that and um, wonder if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yep, because it shows the different, the different components and the direction that we're going. Well, I'd just like to put some sort of reality to it rather than saying, you know, here we are, you know, and people can say, okay, well, that's fine. And, you know, leave it us to battle it out and just say, but guys, this is, you got to remember, this is how it's going to impact right. you. So, and people may say in, in total, that's fine. We'll live with it. Just leave it alone. But I think that's the kind of discussion that needs to be had rather than having the planning board out there pushing a perspective, whatever that might be, cottage housing or duplexes, the community needs to come to some understanding of what it wants and what it wants to see. Because I'm not particularly interested in when we did with senior housing, going through three town meetings and three, probably four or five years of rehashing this and battling and, and it, um, uh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I've been there and done that. I want the community to sort of say collectively to the degree that we can get them, here's what we think makes the most sense. Go do it. Right? Well, if you look at what the market is saying, the market wants to build $900,000, $1.2 million single-family houses. Anytime anybody gets a Form B, whether it's on Wenham, uh, off of Dodges Row, that's what they're doing. They're building for people who are 35 years old and have two kids and want to move to the suburbs and have a good school system. And that's what the market sees as the value of the town. Well, is that the market or is that the profit-driven market? Some well, they're one and they're one in the same. They're one in the Not same thing. Early because. Uh, uh, what's the name? De Franza, uh, Harbor Light Community Partners is not a profit-driven organization, so they were going to draw. They wanted to build something that's a lot less expensive and a lot lower price point. Yeah, so but that's not market because they're getting affordable. they're they're getting huge amounts of back-end subsidy from the federal government in terms of construction, plus they're getting rent sup supplement tenants. It's a, it's a hugely subsidized program. Okay. That may be, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's a type of market and a type of, of selling and, and doing. And well, I, 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 it's not I, really I, a market. I'm talking about I want to jump in there because um, you know, this, is, this is an excellent argument and it's something we will certainly get into in great detail. Um, but uh, I would just say, Bill, I think we've got to keep an open mind. The market is building what the market is allowed to build, and that's single family, large single family homes, or in our town, senior housing. That's it. There's nothing else they have. So there isn't a cottage housing bylaw. There's not a duplex um, bylaw. There's no other option that is attractive to the market other than building single family houses because there's no zoning that allows anything other than. Well, there is. We have quarter acre zoning. How much land is there? You know, Patrick, that might be a good thing. How much vacant land is there in R, RA, R1, R2, and R, what's the quarter acre? We still have some land. So Not much. <laughs> How much yeah, building? The housing land? production plan yeah, it does a lot of mapping, which I, I think is really illustrative. It illustrates how little of the town is really remaining for development purposes. Of any kind, right. Yeah. Yeah, because I can't believe there wouldn't be a market for something that was worth, that cost less than that. There would be people to buy it 
if it was 400,000. You can't build new housing for 400,000. I mean, you can build Well, you can if you have density. Yeah. That's the whole yeah. point. Uh, it's, it's a different uh, density is Bill, you've got your mindset. No, I'm looking. I have. I look at statistics. House, and you I can't look, do no, that. It doesn't have to be two million dollar houses. I'm saying you can't build in this part of the country four hundred thousand dollar attached houses. It's really difficult. So where is everybody living that doesn't make enough? They're living money? in an existing old housing, older housing. What, what did you find out with your your um, two acres downtown that you dropped that as a? I'm sorry. What are we talking about? The Hamilton Housing. No. What do you call Hamilton, Hamilton Development, Development Corporation? Corporation? Yeah. You had a, a property. Still have it. Yeah. One acre. Yeah. And you were going to build 18 units or something. Well, what we're planning on doing, um, and you're welcome to come to a meeting at. 7.30 tomorrow morning is we've hired uh, uh, a law firm, an engineering firm, and an architectural firm to um, put together uh, all the data necessary to submit a site plan to this planning board for, and it depends on what the land will support in terms of stormwater drainage and mm -hmm. septic. Uh, the numbers right now are somewhere around 20 bedroom um, apartment um, building. That may go up, may go down, um, but not by any large amount. So if it gets approved by this planning board through site plan review, it will, we will then take that and put it out onto the market as a, a permitted project mm -hmm. with the hope that developers will say, okay, uh, you, you've overcome. And you can do this without subsidies? Yes. So what do you think they're going to, you do that, I bet you those developers will come in at about $300,000 a unit, and they'll want to charge rents of $2,000 a month, $1,800 a month? Um, well, we don't know uh, what we've got, but could be, could be $1,800 a month. Yeah, that um, seems pretty good. But there is no, there's virtually no rental housing in this town, and that's the problem is there's just for people that want to come in or stay, whether it's divorcees or uh, young people or, you know, people want to get out of their house and just be in a place where they don't have to worry about anything. They just be there. So it's not, it's not going to address all the issues. He was asking a specific question, and I'm giving him a specific answer about that piece of property. Where's your meeting? Tomorrow? Say again? At what, what I know it's 730. Where? Oh, here. In this room? Yes. Okay, I'll stay, stay the night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to talk about here, and, and with lots of fr uh, fruit for dissection. Um, and we're not going to solve that problem tonight. But I'm, I'm more interested in getting the public engaged and telling us what they want to see, rather than us telling them what we believe is the right thing and then having to try and shove it down their throat. Because um, it's just, too, it's really too much work and um, I'd like to engage and have you, Bill, um, engaged and part of the discussion and coming to the conclusion that there are many different answers to the, resolving this problem. There's no one way to do it, but understanding we've got to do something or we're just gonna be doing the same thing over and over again, and, and what's the definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing over and again, expecting a different result. So I'd rather have, and, and that, that's what the general population says, that's fine, then we know what our marching orders are. Um, but I, I'd rather not go off half-cocked thinking I know what the answer is without having the public tell me what they think they will support. So how would you, how did you react to the town meeting of three or four town meetings ago when cottage housing was shot down, you know, seven to one? Um, well, naturally I was... How do, you, how do you interpret that? Well, um, my interpretation was that it got completely uh, 
consumed um, by the affordable housing frenzy that was going on in town at the time. My belief is that if we'd proposed that probably two years before, probably wouldn't have been a lot of uh, discussion. I mean, it was the Board of Selectmen wanted to see it happen. They were before this board, you know, demanding that we have a cottage housing bylaw. Uh, survey that Sean um, did indicated a strong support for cottage housing. Um, the Finance Committee, though, had misgivings because of its impact on the tax rate. Who? The Finance Committee. I never heard that. I they don't never, that they never came to us and said they had any concern about it whatsoever. Who's the chairman? At that time, David Wanger was. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm asking at this point in time to have the Finance Committee intimately involved in this discussion so they know what the financial impact is and they can tell us where the town is going financially. What do they see happening in terms of um, the town's need for increased revenue over time and where that revenue is going to come from and who's going to be paying that? Well, right now we know it's going to be the residential tax base. Well, I'd like them to be involved in this discussion so that if a proposal comes up, they can say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, or it doesn't because it's going to have negative impacts one way or the other. Um, so um, I'd like to everybody to be involved in this. I think the schools need to be involved in it as well. I'd like to see the school committee at least have a representative here so because um, They've got long-term visions. The town's got long-term visions. The town's putting together a, and has a capital um, management committee that's going to be looking at long-term capital needs, which is, I've got to believe, in the tens of millions of dollars for roads and infrastructure. So, you know, this is all a wonderful time to be talking about this because when it all comes down to it, it's hitting all of us and the residential tax base. So how are we going to deal with this? Are we happy where we are, or do we want to see something different? That's the question, and I want that kind, of, that kind of discussion, and that's why we're doing this whole thing from my perspective is lay the facts out on the table from the Finance Committee, from the Capital Management Committee, from the Planning Board, from the Affordable Housing Trust, from the School Committee, and have a discussion to say, great, you guys all want this stuff, but how are we going to pay for it? Are you willing to pay for it? And do you know what the impacts are? So that's the kind of discussion I would like to see. And I know people will say, I'm happy. I'll pay higher taxes. I'm happy with that. That's OK. You have that point of view. What are other people saying? And where is the consensus? Where is the majority lie? Uh, that's all I can hope for. Can I bring up a different subject uh, before we sure. do whatever we're going to do when we get done doing it? Uh, that uh, there was a, sent around to all of us a proposal for some kind of a conservation bylaw. Uh, well, I think everybody can we talk about that under new business. Huh? Can we do that under new yeah. business? Sure. Yeah, or uh, board business. Like sure. Existing so anyway, uh, that's all. You yeah, know. Uh, okay. So hopefully, maybe on August 9th we'll have the date and maybe we can have a more um, focused discussion on how to make all this happen. I'll send it out as soon as the consultant gets back to me. And I, I'd just love to see, once we have that data, is get the library locked in if we can. Sure. And hopefully we can get um, cable there, even though I know they don't have facilities, or maybe we can tape it for future broadcast. Yeah, they can do the library. Okay, great. Any other discussion on that? Okay. Okay. So, board business, meeting minutes, committee reports, future agenda items. Do you want to? Sure. Uh, okay. So we got this uh, draft that was taken from uh, somebody named Wendell, or place named Wendell. Wendell. Yeah. And town of Wendell. Town of Wendell. Uh, I know a Wendell Ketchum. At any rate. Uh, it was, I have forgotten how many pages long, but I read the whole thing. And then I go, wait a minute, let's read uh, the, whatever else there is, and uh, got directed to the conservation, no, yeah, the 
Conservation Commission on their website has a conservation bylaw. bylaw. And it's pretty redundant. It's pretty redundant. And there was very little, I saw no added v value that I could see in my inexperienced eye in reading this draft, this Wendell report. I thought Wendell's was more poorly written than ours. Uh, first of all, and get to us. Can I, can let me, uh, do you have any further comment? Well, it just it needs to be. First of all, is it going to go to the town council? Uh, has anybody seen any added value to Zero. that draft from Wendell? And is just any, more generally, any, any what, value what, to what, it? What was that? Yeah, what, <laughs> that was a uh, um, proposed conservation bylaw uh, not a zoning bylaw but a regular town bylaw that one of the selectmen believed to be appropriate uh, to start advancing uh, with the community um, I'm unaware of efforts to uh, engage the public about it I don't know you know where it stands with the conservation commission um why does it have hamilton on the top then i don't understand it uh it was written by you know i i presume that was uh the selectman that prepared it uh provided it to the town manager um i had been asked for that text by a member and I figured that this would be something that the whole board would be interested in because it's directly affecting land use. So I, can, you know, I, I sent it some, out to individual members. I can add some background. It's uh, being proposed by um, Rosemary Kennedy. Um, and I think this is a continuation of the discussion um, that uh, re relative to the conservancy district that the town meeting repealed at uh, town meeting last year. That was based on discussions we had with Mark Bobrowski and our then town council it, because it had no objective criteria to be able to enforce. It was, it was a first attempt in the early 1960s to try and delineate um, wetlands and it was observational and quite subjective but it had no criteria um, to measure wetlands and distances from wetlands. And there was no, um, under the current um, Wetlands Protection Act, people actually have to go out and measure and right. do actual. Very, very carefully documented. Right, very carefully documented. There was a segment in town um, that include Rosemary that felt very strongly that the Conservancy District should be retained. Uh, however, it wasn't. So um, Rosemary is bringing back this um, Wendell's bylaw to try and reestablish um, arbitrary guidelines about what can be built and what can't be built in specific distances away from um, wetlands. But it doesn't specify how you measure yeah. that or. I read it and I couldn't find anything like that. Right. So why would we need this um, given our conservation bylaw? It's well, part of the question. I think that that is a that's a fair question, Bill. Um, and from uh, and I'm the person that asked Patrick to get that because I had tuned in and was watching a board of selectmen's meeting. I think three, two or three weeks ago, and this came up. And Rosemary just described her interest in seeing it put on the warrant for um, this fall town meeting. And I went, whoa you know, is that a zoning bylaw? I thought it was a zoning bylaw, and I'm saying, well, you know, we've already gone over this. We've re rejected a conservancy district. How is this coming back again? So, um, and I, as far as I know, um, and I've asked Patrick to find out, is has the town council reviewed this and opined that it's superseded by our existing bylaw or the state's Wetlands Protection Act um, is it redundant? Is it defensible? And um, then when are public hearings going to occur? Because as I understand it, it's all warrant articles are due by August 5th. Yeah. 
Well, that doesn't leave a whole lot of time to have that kind of question that you just asked, Bill, answered. So I, I don't know any more than that. I haven't heard anything. Well, yeah, that's all I know. It's not adapted. Uh, if she wanted to adapt it, but uh, it's not adapted other than someone wrote the town on top of it, but then it, they left Wendell in the middle of it. And, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with types of land and yeah. so forth. So it's a regular old Wendell wetlands and, and the other part of the problem was uh, from all the discussion that we had about the cons conservancy district, this doesn't do any more than our conservation bylaw does. It doesn't go any further. Well, and well I think that, different. And, and I, I think mean, maybe we could have somebody on the CONCOM somewhere look at it and say, you know, this whole part of this is redundant, but here's an interesting idea, or this whole part is, you know, I think you're going to have it a hard has, time to waste yeah, I think the CONCOM has received it. I don't know if they have analytically looked at it to compare whether or not this new proposal duplicates what their existing bylaw does. You know, from my reading of the existing CONCOM bylaw, this new text does much of the same thing. Right. Um, you know, and and also, as I look at it, I think, um, you know, it. I'm not sure why it's necessary when you look at what the state, um, Mass requires. Chapter Three Ten CMR requires, which is you know a hundred foot bordering wetlands protective, you know buffer. You know, and, and it also, I noticed that it did not include banks, which, you know, banks are protected within the Rivers Protection Act, which was approved like 1990. Right. Uh, you know, which to me, that makes that already violative of another state law. So there's some issues Somebody that, that should text have a, needs well, to talk deal with. with Rosie. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do You want to, I mean, I know her. Do you know her too? Sure. Well, I and was just, and just say, look, um, why don't we table this and look at, the, look at the issues it raises and see if it fills in any gaps. And if it doesn't, we, we already have what we need. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it fills in any gaps at all. Well, I'd be happy to talk with her because I just think it's totally misguided right now. It's very confusing. But she was on the... Right. Um, committee that wanted to, it was the and Open Space Committee as was well proposing it, yeah. So I think maybe that would be good for you to talk I'll to her. I'll go back and find out. All right. And I can talk with you. To you. To okay. Next meeting if I'm here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, That's the way to do it. Um, uh, meeting minutes? Uh, Oops, sorry. Can I, can I uh, put this out there? You have received a couple of invitations from me regarding uh, this discussion regarding uh, water, water. Uh, water use, water production, et cetera. Uh, that meeting is to be held. Uh, it's sponsored by the Board of Selectmen, town staff. It's to be held Monday night, July 29th, uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, this will be at the Hamilton American Legion, which is at 37 School, School Street. Street. I, I got it. Okay. So uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. I know that uh, the meeting? Uh, actually the uh, presenter, as I understand it, is going to be Ray Mieras, who has been uh, the town's uh, consultant specialist regarding water resources for quite some time and he he's quite you know in command uh, so you know I definitely intend to go well, I will too but is there a, a real agenda item do they have something they're proposing or um, just look at your uh, invitation no I read it I okay put it down but uh, they're going to change the way they process water. They're going to I don't. 
Hey, here's Should what get the lines or something. Or? Here's what you probably read if you read this, as I sent it to you. How much water do we have? Yeah. I know this. Uh, yeah, Green Meadows project sparked a lot of got, discussion you know, got a about lot of that. Uh, is there enough water to allow development? Where do we get our water from? Why is there always a water ban? Why does it cost so much? What do we do to treat our water for? Is there enough? How do we protect our water sources? Those are the kinds of things that uh, they'll be addressing. Well, In anticipation of Green Meadow, I went and looked at the state data. They have all the cities and towns, and what aquifer each city and town draws its water from, where the water comes from, and how near capacity they are, and what kind of caps there are, if any, on municipal use of water. And it was really interesting. Um, a lot of places have got huge amounts of reserves, and then there's <laughs> Hamilton, which is you know, like 95% of its capacity, actually, and that was two years ago. Yeah, but it's actually about 70% of its capacity, according to uh, Tim Olson, because I talked to him about that. But anyway, that'll be, get talked about. Right. The one thing that I'd love to see on the agenda, unfortunately I can't be there, is what is the town doing to enforce its water ban? Because I can tell you, I've seen, you know, when that water band goes up and the big banner is up there and then I drive by and people have got their sprink automatic sprinkler systems going. Um, I'm sure this is political heresy, but I'm, I'm going to say we don't have a water problem. We have a water usage problem. And it's only really in three months of the year, and it's July, August, and September that we are constrained. And that's because people are out watering their lawns wildly. So I'd like to know what the town is doing to enforce its own water regulation, water usage regulations, so that we are not in this constrained um, situation all the time. Yes, we need to find more water resources. Um, our aquifer, the Ipswich River Basin, is, is strained by too many communities drawing from it. So if we can get into the Manchester whatever it, um, uh, Cape Ann aquifer, that would be great yeah. because uh, evidently it's quite large and underutilized currently. But given the situation we have is I, just people are just ignoring any kind of water ban. And they're just, um, and even when they're told not to do it, they just continue to do it because there's no enforcement. And so. part, of the, part of the problem it may be more not the lack of water, but the inability of the town pumping capacity to pump the water. Because no, I understand I there's some problems heard, still I going. I haven't heard I haven't that heard being that. a problem. You can always add pumps. I think uh, especially we just, we just spent several million dollars upgrading the facility. So, well, we, we might ask Tim to come and make a presentation to us after that meeting because he's talking about expanding the um, capacity they want to build uh, double the capacity up on Browns Hill, and that's something that we've heard about on the task force that we're talking to the uh, seminary. And they want a about. bigger, basically, a bigger water tower. Yeah, I, I think it. I think the it question is, do they want it above ground? And Tim has said, no, we just have to have it come up to the surface and have a better cover on it. But there's a lot of they can blast out on the rock, I guess, a lot of stuff under underground. But I. I would love to see a coalescence of the two ideas of a cell tower and a, and a water tower in the same place. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's, let's stop that yeah. right there. I think uh, a lot of those questions actually belong at that uh, meeting on the 29th because the, I asked Tim some of the same kinds of questions uh, for the Open Space Committee, and he said, come to the meeting. Right. Well, anyway. So I think that would be, it's a wonderful, I'm glad they're doing it. So hopefully there'll be some good information. Um, meeting minutes? Uh, Marcy was on vacation earlier, so the July 9th meeting minutes aren't available yet. Okay. C can I rub your nose in that one for a second? <laughs> I got our open space minutes from July yesterday or today. Well, we got prioritized out. Yeah. Um, any other things that people would like to talk about? Okay. 
So the next meeting is August 6th, 7 p.m. Okay. We are not doing the executive session? Sure yeah. Uh, let's see. You need to read the top and then 3B. Top and 3D. Okay, yes, we are going into executive session. Okay. I request a motion that the board vote to convene an executive session for the purpose of discussing, um, let's see, 3B. Discussing strategy with respect to litigation because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the board. So would somebody make a motion to make a motion to we go, go into an executive session to to discuss litigation that would have a detrimental effect. Yeah. What's it in relation to? Do, do I have a second? Second. Second. All right. This needs to be a roll call vote. Um, we need to vote aye. 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 Uh, Janelle Curry votes aye. Rick Mitchell votes aye. Peter Clark votes aye. Bill Wheaton votes aye. Daniel Ham votes aye. Richard Boroff votes aye. Okay, we're now in executive session, so the recording.